we talked about Susan being from Camden, being an Army brat, about meeting Jim McDougal, who kicked in the door and impressed her with his macho-ness, then how she ended up getting married at the Goat House, and then ended up owning a bank in Kingston. And that's just the beginning of the story. Wait till you hear the good stuff. (laughs) So now... We own a bank, in, in a small bank in Kingston, which I'm kind of jealous of. That sounded like a lot of fun to redo. Are you living in that little city? Oh, yes, yes. We moved up there. Okay. But Jim sees an opportunity for a business in Little Rock because he's missing, I think, the big city. And he opened up, if he founded, I guess he founded, Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan. Tell us how that came about. Um, Madison actually was for sale. It was one little small savings and loan in a very small town in Arkansas, which I can't remember. And he bought it and branched it to a lot of different cities. And he did the major bank uh, savings and loan. He bought that building and redid it. And it was the the major. In downtown Little Rock, Arkansas. Yes. It was very impressive. And this is more about, at the opening, we talked about how Jim was bipolar. So when he had upswings, he had major upswings. And one, he had a customer I think who was a Mercedes dealership and he wanted all the people in his in his uh that worked for him the tellers and everybody to have Mercedes in the parking lot he bought people a lot of things he bought first he bought them clothes from um oh the lovely store for men here in Little Rock that Mr. Wicks Mr. Wicks yes Mr. Wicks and he bought everyone gorgeous clothes to work in the bank and they they love that well i guess i I mean they looked really good and uh they were not used to dressing that way and they just loved jim for that now this is a this is so opposite of him not wanting to put on airs and yet he's giving these really expensive clothes to the people that work for his to young people to young people to young people to sort of uh set a standard or to help them to see how they might empower yeah Mm -hmm. yeah really that was what it was Mm -hmm. Um, because Ernie Dumas wrote that Jim looked like he had his clothes thrown on him from a distance. So <laughs> he did. They think, hung on him like sacks. I, I know. I, I don't think you can say he was dressing himself that way because he always uh, dressed for comfort. He, he was like Winston Churchill. He didn't want anything touching his cuticle, as he called it. His cuticle? Is that your the, skin? The skin, yes. <laughs> Isn't that funny? That's one of the, you know, the quoting things and the knowing poetry and the knowing literature. Just lovely. You know, I don't like anything touching my cuticle, as Winston Churchill would say. You know, that's just lovely. <laughs> I, I thought that was a wonderful way to live. Yeah. So he buys everybody clothes. Then he puts all the, then he buys them Mercedes, but he, but, but the employees actually make the note payments. Yeah. They pick their car and they decide what they're going to pay and all of that jim introduced them to the guy that owned the mercedes place and he still owns the bank of kingston yes and he's still doing real estate yes and he's still actually the savings and loan was purchased to uh finance real estate purchases for people throughout the state of arkansas uh, because it was hard at that time for some folks to get uh, loans. loans. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, money was tight. It was hard, and he was going to have a real estate place for the people. It was going to be for the people to own property. Yeah, it's kind of a vertical integration in business. He's going to sell the money, then take you over to his bank, and then his bank's going to loan you the money, and he's going to improve people's lives and his life too, and everybody's. I mean, it's, it's building a big community the making money from it was not the big priority unfortunately one of the things that the independent council never found was any money you know i kept saying where's the money if if we are these people who've done all these things but the profit was never it it was always involving people and showing them how to make money how to take a piece of land how to carve it up how to put water in or roads and and then to buy these I mean, we we sold lots to people who had never dreamed of having a five-acre lot with a house on it. Yeah. And then we introduced them to builders who knew that we were going to finance the end product for them. And the builder would come and make that design that they wanted. I mean, it was people who never had that dream before. 
And I get that from where Jim's coming from. I love the creative process of business. It's the building of something and the hooking it up. And, you know, you don't, there's a lot of things you do in business that are, that are labors of love, that are fun and that are creative, that are not necessarily the best business decision. I've had it lots was, of bankers tell me they go, that's not really a good idea to buy the Taborian Hall in downtown Little Rock, Carry. That's a really bad idea. I'm like, well, it's a labor of love. I can't help it. I want to redo it. Yes, absolutely. And it was the 70s and early 80s when um, and it was we were fun. very idealistic. We were very idealistic. And it, it's interesting that you said that about Madison Guarantee because after all the combing through of everything by Whitewater, they never found anything but a misdemeanor for an, uh, an appraisal that was a little too high that was done by a subcontractor. Yeah, it, it was never there was anything. N- there was no there there. Kenneth Starr went on TV and said Madison Guarantee is the most corrupt institution in the country, and they never found one thing. No. They asked me to come and testify to uh, Congress about what had been found, and so I got to go sit and look at all the findings. There was literally nothing. Which I don't think most people realize that. I just assumed it had so much negative publicity. I just assumed there was something there. There had to be a smoking gun. I mean, I never knew what it was, but I just assumed it was bad because it, of the bad press. I think it was just the first of a long line of uh, bad information out there, just like we have now, where people don't believe that the coronavirus is real. And Big they news. don't think, yes, mm-hmm. it's just all of that information, you can drown people in it. And I do think that people believe there was something there, but that one sentence tells you why I went to jail rather than testify Mm -hmm. because I'm a person who knew there was nothing there what was your position at the bank um wife (laughs) (laughs) you didn't work at the work you didn't work at the bank at all (laughs) no oh no I never had a position at the bank I sold real estate but I was not a banker no yeah you just did things when Jim told you to do something so your lot your life with Jim was starting to unravel you were starting to realize that he's got a problem he's bipolar you didn't know it was bipolar I don't think yet did he you? bought an island sight unseen that was the beginning of the crack for me he bought Campobello Island where is and that it's in it's near Can- it's in Canada and it's uh, formerly owned by, well, it had a house there where uh, President Roosevelt had been bathing and, and got, um, was crippled. Got uh, polio from polio there? Polio from there. Their house is still there in, in, in perfect shape with everything in it that was ever there. And we went to see that. And, well, after we bought it, we went to see that. That was lovely. And the island was lovely. The Bay of Fundy is in is around that mm, island. And I know what that is. Is it, it is developed? Absolutely. Is it developed exquisite. now? Is it developed now? I have no idea. But the name itself is enough to like make that? me have <laughs> complete breakdown. Why did you not like that? If it was lovely, fact, and everything this was beautiful. The whole conversation's giving me rash. A complete breakdown. It's giving you a rash. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm I'm inarticulate to say the least. Um, he saw that island for sale and he looked at the price and at what it was and he said we're buying it and he sent one of the people from the bank up there and they bought it and came home and said we have it it's ours whatever happened to it he sell it or lose it or oh i don't know i really don't um we sold a lot of it we had a you know we developed some of it oh Mm mm-hmm so you said that's the crack. That was the beginning of what are we doing? Wasn't Jim and I was were you older. And Jim living together. I was older. How, you have to remember. How old are you now? I am probably that was. Let's see. I got married in seventy six and I left in eighty six. So I was thirty something. Mm-hmm. You're starting to be a I'm woman. S- I'm starting to realize I might need to say something. Yeah, I need a voice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I probably should be saying something right now, and it was scary so what's the first thing you did when you left you moved out told him what do you say um i think he helped me out he was manic 
and he was having a good time. Oh, he was on the top of it. Yeah, the, life was really good for him. You don't want to be with me. You're out of here. I no, it was you. like, go, have a good time, and, you know, this is what you want, and I want what you want, and if oh. someone falls out of love with you, there's just not much you can do about it. Had he saying he'd fallen out of no, love with you? No, he was saying I had. Oh. And he was saying there's just not much to be done. You know, we don't want to argue or anything. So I think he helped me out with my luggage. So you start wow. dating. And it was friendly. It was mm-hmm. nice. Mm-hmm. And we talked every day, and it was it was angry. It wasn't. Mm-hmm. And I worried about him because I knew that he was manic, and I knew that bad things were Well, you happening. loved him. Yes, absolutely. But you start dating Pat. This is when you start dating Pat. You've known Pat for a long time. Well, we knew each other. He worked there, and we knew each other, and he was reasonable. And it was such, <laughs> it was such, it was such a relief to talk to someone reasonable. And he loved Jim. He loved him, and so did I. And we talked about what was happening, and he was aware of it. Most people, when you try to talk to them about someone who is manic and the things that are going on, they look at you like you're crazy. But Pat knew what was going on. He was worried also. And so we built a friendship really around worrying about Jim. Interesting. Mm-hmm. You're such a nice person. I cannot believe all the stuff that's happening. Okay, let's just keep going. <laughs> you see, I told you, people don't believe it. No. But everybody, when I told them that we were going to be visiting and I was going to be interviewing, they go, oh, she's just so nice. You're not going to believe how nice she is. I'm like, Susan McDougal is so nice. And they're like, yes. And I'm like, that girl that was on the news all the time portrayed it's, as yeah. this Who evil have been doer broken. yeah <laughs> all right they, they tortured her so bad <laughs> no right yeah. uh so you moved to you and pat decide to move to california yes you're you're going off jim's fine you're leaving are you divorced yet no no we didn't divorce forever okay so the first job you you get in california is with occidental petroleum and uh you went i think you went to an employment uh, uh, agency to get the job, I think. And the yeah, I wasn't you- wanting anything, you know, really to do except file things. I can remember saying, I would like to put pieces of paper in file folders because I'm so traumatized by all of what's going on. Ten um, years with Jim. Yeah, I was traumatized by the divorce. I was traumatized by what was happening to, uh, he was hiring a lot of uh, de- uh, people who were looking to make a big bunch of money and we had never been like that it was never our goal to make a lot of money but people were coming into the business that were having dreams that were about making a lot of money it was scary to me it was not what we had always been about Mm -hmm. and so I was really traumatized when we left and I I told uh, everybody I said if I can get a job just filing pieces of paper I will be so happy as I've been selling real estate I've you know my last year I made a lot of money selling real estate yeah commissions yes not being paid for anything but on a commission you, and i didn't want that anymore i just wanted a peaceful life you fill out a resume with that um with that agent employment agency <clears throat> that comes back to haunt you not really i thought it did well it was supposed to but oh, they tried to make it haunt <laughs> they you. tried to make it haunt me but unfortunately for them i told the truth I said, I needed a job. So I told them that I could do secretarial work. And they said, you you put down here that you were a secretary. And I said, well, yeah, that's the job I wanted. I thought I'd better say I had some experience. And they said, what was your experience? I said, well, I'd sold real estate. I had helped build the bank. I had done marketing stuff. I had done a lot of things. I didn't want to do that anymore. I just wanted to work in a peaceful place. And the jury all looked at me like, what is so wrong about her saying that she so let's was a secretary? Li- let's What's tell the tired? listeners that in the Whitewater uh, trial, they tried to call. They tried to say Susan is this notorious liar. She lied on her resume, which is who doesn't? First of all, uh, yeah. you well, know. who who lies down? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't like I was saying. Yeah, I can run AT and T. It was like, yeah, just please, can I type and answer the phone because I'm traumatized. I need a quiet place. So when I held that up, I held it up like this in the jury room, and I said, yes, I absolutely lied on this. I have never been a secretary, but I thought I might be able to figure it out. 
And they loved it. They, they loved bet, it. They, they bet, talked to me part. about it later. You know, that jury actually came and had dinner with me and came to Little Rock for the Little Rock trial. That jury followed me and for the rest of my life. Wow. And I held that piece of paper up, the fraudulent, horrible Susan McDougall who lied down. Um, and they, they just thought it was unbelievable how they had made such a big deal out of it. But well, the, you have to if you have nothing. Right. So your Pat, though, he gets a job with conductor Zubin. How do you spell, say, say Zubin's last name? Meta. Meta. Mm-hmm. So he's a famous conductor. Charming, good-looking. Zuby and Baby was his nickname in Zuby LA. Baby. But he's also an absentee husband. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So his wife lives in California, and she's got all the money, and she's got all the prestige, and her husband is this big hot dog uh, conductor. Oh, with- she's fabulously beautiful, too. She is. Uh, in Jason and the Argonauts, she is the goddess in that movie. Oh, oh she! Oh, cool. and she was in Bewitched. She was Darren's girlfriend, who was so gorgeous, and Samantha was uh, angry at her. And she was in Dean Martin films and all of those spy films. She was absolutely fabulously beautiful, tall, good looking, blonde, I guess, smart, um, blonde, yes. And so uh, Pat's working for her, and he decides to go off to get his law degree and to leave California. And where does he go to get to start studying for law? Uh, the University of Michigan. So he goes to Michigan, and he's been her assistant for a year or so. And he says, you want she my job? She does real estate. She, oh, she, she owns and sells real estate. Okay. And so he's going to leave that position and, and ask you if you want it. No. Okay. He leaves the position. She's met me because he works there, uh-huh. and she likes me. We strike up a friendship, and we do a lot of things together before Pat leaves. And when he leaves, she said, "I, you know, I have been dreaming of you coming to work for me." And um, she's on a mountain with the gorillas in the mist. I'm trying to talk like I remember it being said. Mm-hmm. She's on a mountain with gorillas in the mist. You in know what dream. I'm talking about? No, dream. no, no. In the actuality of it, she is in Africa oh. where they see the gorillas. Uh-huh. They write uh-huh. about the gorillas in the mist. Mm-hmm. And this came to me that you need to come and work with me. I mean, who can say no to that? But I should have because I, all I wanted was a peaceful life, right? Mm-hmm. That did not work out well. Describe a day with Nancy. I once thought about writing a book about my experiences there. Um, She wanted, we had a a butler there who was um, gay and also hilarious and had lots of, uh, this was a a time when all gay men were having liaisons uh, like hourly and people were coming in and out of the Meta mansion with the butler all the time and he, he was hilarious. Then she had a dog that bit everyone. It was um, a Russian wolfhound, and the dog bit everyone that I ever saw the dog with. I mean, one lady in the face, and but the dog n- only bit people. I'm going to, from my perspective, the dog knew who to bite <laughs> because. <laughs> No one ever sued. No one ever did anything. Um, it was just sort of like, oh, my gosh, you know. And so we were going to pack a van with the dog and the butler and me and Nancy and drive from California to New York City. Whoa. And I thought, I'm writing a book about this. This has got to be the greatest trip ever made. We didn't do it. But I. Oh. that's the kind of thing, though that we did do a day in the life was not um it was uh she had a lot of rental property tom hanks lived in one of the houses um trying to think uh dinah dina sure uh dina uh her mother wrote uh books about etiquette um post was her mother mary weather post oh, yeah. uh dina merrill mm-hmm Oh. Uh, yeah, beautiful. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. And uh, she had houses where people who were very famous lived in them. And we would go over 
and see if things needed to be done or talk to them about, you know, what they needed or would you like a larger fish pond or, you know, whatever it was. Whatever it was, we, we were ladies who went. Oh, I remember one day, um, who was in Love Story? Allie McGraw. I met Allie McGraw at the house, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, all day. I'm like, I just love her. So I get over there, and it's raining. It's crazy. And we get at the front door, and she turns to me, and she says, hi, I'm Allie. And I said, that's it? That's, <laughs> that's the whole thing? People um, were so um, real. Do you know what I mean? It was mm-hmm. funny to me. Being from Arkansas, I'd just wasn't expecting it so she rented a house and you know it was funny everything that happened was funny you everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time yes that's yes what, but that, this gorgeous woman standing at the door thinks she has to introduce herself yeah i mean that's funny to me yeah i'm Allie. yeah we know yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're all uh even though she was crazy you liked her but you you oh we were very close oh my gosh Y'all did everything together. Well, that was by that was not by my choice, but yes. She wouldn't let you out of her sight. No. She made you sleep with her sometimes. I mean, not just no. like bunking parties. and No, we never slept. I thought you had to spend the night there sometimes. Like no, no. She, she came and I was in an apartment and she had the movers come and pick my things up and put them in her house. She had a huge home that was Steve McQueen's home when Steve McQueen was alive and uh, it was enormous and she just put my things in the house because her husband never came home and she was pretty lonely much. and she pretty was lonely much. yes so you started noticing she was a little quirky and clingy and you decided i need to get my life back and you start talking about wanting to leave she was not going to go for that no that was the that really in fact her attorney said to me this is not going to end well she gets what she wants and this is not going to go well but so how many years did you know but i for? was an adult and i figured i could go you right know? how many years did you work for her oh not that many i don't know five maybe oh that's a pretty long time you always disagree with me <laughs> yes i guess so <laughs> <laughs> i'm going with it yeah that's a long time that is kind of long i thought yeah. you were going to say two or three years she was lovely she was um pretty she was funny um she took uh she liked uh going and you know everyone eating lots of food i mean when she took people out to eat including me she ordered and the table was enormously full i mean like bring us two of those we would like one of those bring that let us see the desserts bring all of those desserts there were two people at the table and we would just be like you know that's hard to leave that's hard to leave even if she is quirky and clingy that's hard to leave i didn't think there was anything wrong with her i I enjoyed her quirkiness and she enjoyed my quirkiness Mm -hmm. we got along well Mm -hmm. in fact at the trial when Mm -hmm. i was charged with uh stealing money from her she walked in the back door of the courthouse of the of the courtroom and she didn't know where to go she was supposed to go to the witness stand and she stood there for a minute and she was going like where do I go and very hesitant and I turned to my attorney Mark Garrigus and I said please go help her please help her get where she needs to go I mean I knew her well enough to know that she was in trouble she didn't know what she was supposed to do you're such a nice person if you like this video subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the picture of Carrie's face in the center of the screen for more of Carrie's interviews click either video on the right of the screen and as always thank you for watching